We're down with Nitron Racing Systems today to take a close look at their damper dyno and just answer a few questions as to what a damper dyno is and why we'd use one and what it can do. So Curtis, I guess, first of all, what can a damper dyno do and why would we use one? So the dyno is a tool that we use every day to develop shock absorbers, to test shock absorbers, to calibrate them, to see if there's any issues that might occur yep. and to put the correct setting into a vehicle that we want, that we think is correct for that car and that spring rate. Cool. So the things that this will produce for us on the computer later is effectively bump versus rebound mm -hmm. at different speeds because the damper is essentially force versus velocity. Mm -hmm. I'm going to test that at different rates. And mm -hmm. so in the likes of a single make championship, mm -hmm. how could this be, tool be used to make sure it's fair game? So we refer to the mini championship, the mini challenge, where we make all the, the dampers for the mini challenge, yep. where we have a datum, a datum graph. Right. And when any dampers come back for repair or service or anything at all, we can then reevaluate that damper on the dyno against the datum graph so that everybody's got the same setting, everybody's got the same graph, there's no advantage between teams. Yep. Um, in one makes especially, it's very important. Yeah, so you're basically looking at that bump versus rebound trace Absolutely. and just make sure they overlay exactly yeah. across the, the board. Char the characteristic of the damper, um, whether it's reading correctly, whether the adjustments are working correctly, yeah. um, every aspect of it really, uh, and just making sure it operates as it should do. So this dyno in particular is mm -hmm. a bit special, isn't it? It's not like yes, a crank yeah. hub. It's, so just tell us about <clears throat> what this can do. So this is an electromagnetic actuator. So most people would see a crank dyno, which is uh, a dyno that, that operates at the same um, displacement all the time. So whether that's 25 or 50 millimeters a second. Yeah. Um, so um, this dyno, we can effectively uh, change the, the, the distance and the speed um, to anything we want. So yeah. you could reenact what a damper is doing on a car with the correct data logging. Yeah. So whether that be between 10 or 20 or 30 or 40, minutes, whatever setting it is, um, this particular one goes up to six meters a second. Oh, really fast. So, so, mm. In this situation, say we're building a damper for the Le Mans 24 hours, mm -hmm. we know the rough sort of surface and mm -hmm. we know the amount of time that damper is going to be working for. Yeah. So we can run that and simulate that on this on this dyno to make mm -hmm. sure that damper is going to survive and it's going to continue Absolutely. and maintain yeah. that health throughout the whole race. Absolutely, yeah. So we could take data logging from the car, for instance, yeah. and then uh, run the damper at a very similar um, range so that we're, we're not concentrating on part of the damper that isn't needed, if you like. Yeah. So um, Le Mans are a great example because of the, the temperature, uh, the long distance that they need to do, um, and the curb strikes as well. They're quite high yeah. at Le Mans. Um, so, you know, without a machine like this, you'd struggle to get it correct. Okay, great. So I guess we can have a little close look at what it can do, mm -hmm. get it up and running, and we'll, we'll see what it produces Absolutely, for yeah. us. Mm -hmm. Cool. All right, so we're going to get Scott in, aren't we, just to... Yeah, uh, Scott's going to show you how it works. Yeah, cool. All right, let's do it. Great. Okay. So what's currently going on with this damper down now? What's actually going on with that damper? Uh, so basically it starts off uh, cycling at 100 millimetres a second. Yeah. And then it gradually work up in 100 mil increments up to 1,500 millimetres a second. Okay. Um, and then it records the force at each of those velocities. Okay. Great. So we're getting an idea of how the damper's working from the expected range you expect to see from it, say on circuit, that you've got from a data log or something similar. It, yeah, exactly. Okay, great. Oh, it's not, it's not finished. So we've effectively just run this damper from mm. full hard on bump and rebound, and we've worked it back in a series of increments to yep. full soft bump and rebound. And it's done these different traces for each of those settings. Yeah, so above the x-axis here we have compression force yep and then below is the rebound okay um so x-axis is velocity yep that's millimeters per second and then on the y-axis we have force in newtons so we, we can see for each setting change how much softer the shot got yep um and it's and it's happening in quite a linear fashion so each adjustment has given you a reliable change in, in damping. Um, yep. And then that, that shows our range of adjustment from fully hard to fully soft. Okay. So if we were to look at this graph now and say the middle two lines were really close together and then they went back to being spaced apart, would that show maybe that the damping increments aren't working well enough? Um, yeah, some, some dampers you might find that you'll come halfway through the range 
and then beyond that point there's very little adjustment okay uh, so what we're really looking for is each click is having the same step change yeah um, so when you adjust it on the car you know exactly that that change is doing the same as the previous two clicks or how, however yep. much you you um, adjusted it what's quite interesting on the bump here is that <clears throat> at the low speeds the force changes are relatively minimal through the mid-range they're quite large and consistent and then again at the very high speeds we've got quite a close sort of difference again what's the reason for it spreading and then coming back together again uh, i think on this damper because it's a freeway we've got the low speed adjuster um set some clicks out okay uh which i didn't change throughout these tests so if we'd have changed the low speed we we, we would have changed this this area here yep that, that's the beauty of a freeway damper you can change high speed independent of what, what's happening down here so if we saw an issue in this area of the graph <coughs> we could have we could alter the low speed to try and correct that and if we saw an issue at this end of the graph would use the high speed and we could fine tune the damper using those two settings and using the graph yeah exactly um when, when the damper is built we will test it against the datum um so we want to make sure that when it's built it's always matching that original spec that yep. we that we built if it's not, it would have to come apart and be rebuilt, but it doesn't happen very often. Yep. Okay, great. And then, so with a four way damper where you have high and low speed <coughs> rebound as well, that would mean that we'd be able to affect this end of the scale as opposed yeah, to exactly. the mid range. It's sim similar fashion, but on, on the rebound side of uh, um, the damping curve. Yep. This is a more accurate graph as to how the damper is actually working. This is where we can see if there's problems. Okay. Um, if the graph was cavitating, we would see this uh, line here dropping away. Right. Um, so it wouldn't be quite as circular, it'd have more peaks <clears throat> and troughs in it. Exactly, yeah. Um, it's normally where there's um, some lack of pressure and then it will build, build damping force again. So what, right. what we're looking for is a nice symmetrical um, graph. Okay. Um, and is that similar if we, if we had like a leaking seal or something like that inside the damper or is that a slightly different shape? Um, leaking seal might not necessarily show up on the dyno okay. uh, unless it's really very bad. Yep. Um, as long as it's still holding pressure then uh, you, that might be a little bit more difficult to see. Yeah. Would that be more apparent on the force bill versus <coughs> velocity graph if you were looking at two of the same dampers? If they didn't overlay them one could have an issue. Yeah, yeah, exactly. If you know that you both started from two good dampers, one's got a problem, then yep. you, you can overlay these two graphs. Right. Um, but th this is the type of graph where we go to to really see an in-depth picture of what's actually happening. Because um, the other graph is only made up of these two peak velocity points. Yep. So if there's a problem in the rest of the curve, it might not show up on that, that other more, more okay. basic graph. Yep. So in, in the likes of the sort of Le Mans 24 hours damper we were discussing earlier, could we test this damper for quite a long period of time, take in different snapshots throughout that time of these graphs, then overlay all those graphs and just see if it does degrade over that time or if it stays fairly consistent? Yeah, so you can do a sort of an endurance test to see how the damper fades. Okay. Um, so it, it will capture each cycle. Yeah. If it's going to fade, the force is going to drop away. So we can see how much it fades by. Right. Um, so yeah, obviously the better dampers, the better oils, they don't lose as much. Yeah. Um, that's kind of one of the key areas where you see a, uh, a cheaper damper, not yep. such a good one. That's that's where it's going to suffer. Okay. Okay. So Scott's just shown us through the different graphs that we can produce using the damper mm -hmm. dyno. So this damper is now effectively ready to bolt onto the car mm -hmm. and go testing at the track. Mm -hmm. Yep, that's right. So uh, the damper's been tested. We do a full sweep through the adjustments to make sure it's working correctly. It's calibrated and it's got the right setting in there. So it gives you the opportunity to then go to the circuit and have a damper that's somewhere close to where the driver will want it set to. So right. each driver's got their individual idea of, of what they want, whether it's a, a car with lots of grip or understeer, oversteer, uh, whatever they want. Now it gives you the ability to fine tune the damper uh, to get it to where they want it to be. Okay, great. So we've got a few questions mm -hmm. from guys over on Instagram. Um, so if I'll just fire a few at you, get your answer. So the first one, how do they keep their str strong enough without going the upside down route? So we use a 22 mil piston shaft 
which is ideal for our applications. Um, so the reason behind that is uh, the, the 22 mil has got more displacement of fluid. So each individual click gives you more feel or you've got more adjustment range in the damper. Um, to keep it strong, you have to keep the glands far enough apart so that there's no overlap. Um, and we also have uh, a specially designed uh, support piston, which sits underneath the main piston to increase rigidity. Right, great. Does a larger piston size really make a noticeable difference? It can do, depending on the application. Um, so by having a larger piston allows you to run a, a higher uh, fluid amount in, inside the shark. Um, and also on some applications such as off-road, um, it allows you to run larger holes in the piston so that you can get the, the damper softer. Um, so you, you sometimes are restricted, but it depends on the application. Um, the By running a larger piston, can also increase the sensitivity across the piston. Right. So if you look at our pistons, they're always 46 or 40 millimeters in a car. Um, anything smaller than that, and you start to lose that sensitivity of the damper. Right, great. So how can a sophisticated damper with a higher spring rate than OEM mm -hmm. ride better than stock in some situations? So OEM are always built to a, a cost. Um, so we've got much more ability to tune the damper. Um, again, coming down to the size of the piston with the sensitivity of, of the piston, um, you can actually have a, a, a much better uh, feel to the damper because you can tune the shim stack much better. So if you imagine you've got a, a twin tube damper, for instance, which has got a very small, maybe a 24 millimeter or a 30 millimeter piston, um, there's only so much oil flow that you can get through that piston. Yeah. So by running a, a, a larger diameter piston again can give you um, that quality of ride. Um, also playing with things such as uh, gas pressures mm -hmm. um, can really help. Okay, great. So looking at the oil inside the damper, mm -hmm. How do you keep oil consistent and away mm -hmm. from the boiling point? And is mm -hmm. there different types of oil you can use or you do use? Yeah, so there's lots of different types of oils. For, for our car damper, we, use, we only use a dedicated uh, damper fluid. Um, it's not uh, just an off-the-shelf hydraulic fluid. Right. Um, it's designed by Silkaline and it's a, a, a particular weight that we use so that we know that that consistent oil uh, works with our damping. Okay, great. Uh, How can a company determine the travel of a damper? and why some brands are different travel for the same car. So it comes down to application really, um, whereas our dampers are, are, are quite often they're um, developed for that car in particular, whereas you get some companies that use uh, an off the shelf tube and piston and cylinder that they've already got. They right. put a different lower bracket onto it, a different top mount, and they call that their shock absorber. So we always look at things like um, the compression stroke to see that you can get the maximum compression stroke and make sure that you've got the maximum amount of movement so that things don't bottom out like lower ball joints or you don't get uh, tires touching the arch or, or you know have, run into problems like yeah. that. So. And do you assume a ride height of that damper would be set to, say, say it was a BMW mm. M2, you'd yeah. install the damper and you'd assume that that would have a certain amount of drop from OEM and absolutely, then you yeah. design it around that yeah, centre. Yeah, absolutely. So um, if you imagine that most people want to lower their cars or, or yep. bring the ride height down for road especially, and then for races, a different application yep. again, um, but you have to make sure that the damper's correct. So there's no point in, in putting a damper on there, which is uh, too long and then you're sat on a bump stop all the time. Yep. And ideally as well, too short, in which case you're topping out and you've got no damper movement. So. Yep. And when it comes to setting the correct damping for a spring rate, mm -hmm. what sort of factors do you take into account? How do you get in that ballpark? Right, so that's, that's, um, that's a really tricky question to answer. Yep. Um, the, every application is different and depends on, on the type of vehicle as well. So um, you can have a, a, a spring rate, which is quite high and actually quite a low um, damping um, on some cars like Porsches, where you've got very, very little stroke on the front. Yeah. Um, you can run a very, very stiff damper and a, a, a sometimes not such a, a stiff spring, um, but depending on the stroke and uh, ev every car is different in the way it reacts. Yeah. So. Okay. So I think this is the last question we've got for you. What is a double digressive piston and what is okay. a digressive piston? So um, pistons, digressive, linear, um, regressive, um, whatever piston it is. Um, digressive is the characteristic of damping that that piston then gives you. So 
Um, Digressive normally uh, gives you a lot of low speed damping initially yeah. and then tails off into a, a, a linear um, curve. Um, whereas uh, just a linear piston just starts from one point and, and carries on. Right. So double digressive, um, if you want to call it, that means that it's digressive on both compression and rebound sides of the piston. Yeah. Um, so we do a, a double digressive, we do a, a linear digressive, which is linear on compression, digressive on rebound. So you can really tune what you want the damper to do. Yeah. And we do it the opposite way as well. So uh, a digressive linear, so digressive on compression, yeah. linear on rebound. So you say you do those different types. Different types, Where would yeah. each one be suited to? Um, so for me, I've, I've always run um, digressive valving um, on race cars, for instance, because it gives you much more effect uh, on, on, on the track. Yeah. Um, most cars will be a linear, um, so they like to be a bit softer. Yeah. But um, on driven wheels, normally, I like to run a linear piston and a digressive piston on a, a non-driven wheel. Okay, great. Mm. I think one more question, just back to the dampers is, when you're setting this damper up, say you, you hit the track mm -hmm. and you set, do you start in the middle of the damping? And then how would you... Everybody's got their own idea of where they yeah. want to start. Um, I'm quite a lover of starting on full hard or full soft yeah. because you can only go in the right direction. Um, some people start in the middle. Yeah. Um, some people already know what they want by looking at the damper graph. So yeah. some engineers will look at that and say, right, okay, I want X amount of damping for this vehicle, so I want to set it here. Um, so it's really down to the person that's tuning the damper. Yeah, mm. great. Mm. Awesome. All right, well, thanks for showing us the dyno today. That's our questions. No problem. Thank you. It was, yeah, a pleasure. Thank you very much. Thanks very much.